भगवत अर्हत सुद्ध स नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सुद्ध स नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत सुद्ध स so uh, i'll be taking an uh, odd sutta today which is uh, not uh, kind of used a lot uh, but uh, i find that there are uh, two things in this sutta one is the direct thing which is a kind of a diet ad advice about uh, how to uh, wean off uh, and become healthy and the other is that this can be used for any kind of a, a hindrance one is facing and a approach to uh, the bigger problems in life uh, which are facing or we bigger kind of a bad habits uh, uh, one accumulates in one's life so this is a kind of a advice to the uh, king uh, so the uh, sutta is samyutta nikaya 13 uh, oblique 3 a back bucket measure of food at savadi now on that occasion king pasanadi of kosala had eaten a bucket measure of rice and curries then a while still full huffing and puffing the king approached the blessed one paid homage to him and sat down to one side then the blessed one having understood that the king pasinali was full and was huffing and puffing puffing on that occasion recited this words when a man is always mindful knowing moderation in food he eats his ailments then di diminish he ages slowly guarding his life so uh, buddha understood that the uh, uh, king uh, was kind of attached to his food and had uh, overeaten or uh, uh, was eating more than what uh, he needed to so he said that when a man is always mindful so uh, what uh, is the advice which you are giving uh, the vante vimadansi also says is that life is meditation meditation is life that means that uh, whenever uh, whatever you are doing you have to be uh, aware of what is happening mindfulness has uh, uh, in uh, pali it is used as sati sati has uh, memory as a component so vante vimadansi says that it is remembering to observe how your mind's attention moves from one thing to another so over here we find that uh, uh, first advice is you have to be always mindful knowing moderation in food he eats he, he knows also in food also there is a middle path so you should not eat a, a very little you should not eat a, a lot but uh, has to be uh, eaten uh, in moderation so there is a uh, uh, sutta in which uh, the buddha says that uh, at, at times the buddha would eat uh, a quarter bowl at times the buddha would eat half bowl at times the buddha would eat the three fourth bowl at times the buddha would eat one full bowl at times buddha would eat more than one bowl full so Uh, what the buddha is saying is that as the occasion is there at that time i eat different measures of food but uh, the moderate uh, the concept of moderation is still applicable over there it means that if you are uh, walking say if you are walking the whole day and uh, the next day uh, in the morning somebody offers you food so you are very hungry and you may eat a little more but you don't eat uh, 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 the amount which can uh, kind of makes you uh, like uh, sick so in that way uh, there is a measure also of a food that uh, half of the uh, stomach a quarter of the stomach should be filled with uh, a solid food quarter with uh, water uh, uh, and a quarter with air and uh, i think something like that uh, i think one third with uh, food one third with water and one third with air that was also a advice the buddha gave so you have uh, some uh, space which is there in the uh, stomach so uh, over here the buddha is saying that uh, when a, a person is mindful he remembers that the moderation is food has to be eaten his ailments then diminish so when you are having the food in uh, a proper amount uh, which is needed 
then uh, your uh, eating in moderation helps uh, you in diminishing your ailments he ages slowly guarding his life so the person who is eating in moderation will have a uh, healthier life so thus he ages slowly so in biological terms currently the uh, uh, concept of aging is that they uh, ca calculate your age in two manners one is that the age as you were born so uh, say somebody is 50 years old so what they do is they uh, do uh, some uh, biological tests and they have uh, parameters on what is your biological age like uh, some people who are in 50 years uh, in the age uh, as per time maybe uh, 60 years biologically they may be uh, more worst off than their age and some may be uh, uh, 40 years biologically because uh, they may have been exercising uh, having good food maybe genetics also <coughs> kind of plays parts in them so this way uh, uh, the buddha is saying that uh, having your food you will age slowly and you are guarding your life now on that occasion the brahmin youth uh, sudhasana was standing behind king pasanadi of kosara the king then addressed him thus come now dear sudhasana learn this verse from the blessed one recite it to me whenever i am taking my meal i i will then present you daily with a hundred kahapanas as a perpetual grant so the buddha uh, uh, the king pasanadi says that uh, to his uh, brahmin uh, uh, employee <laughs> that uh, I will pay you, uh, uh, remind me every day of this verse, so I am aware when I am eating uh, that I have to have uh, moderation in the food. Yes, sir. The Brahmin youth Sudhasana replied, having learned his this work from the Blessed One, whenever King Pasanadi was taking his meal, the Brahmin youth recited, when a man is always mindful, knowing moderation in food, he eats his, uh, 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 knowing moderation in food, he eats. His elements then diminish. He ages slowly, guarding his life. When uh, then uh, King uh, Pasanadi of Kosala gradually reduced his intake of food to at most a pint pot measure of boiled rice. At a later time, uh, when uh, his body had uh, become quite uh, slim, King Pasanadi of uh, Kosala stroked his limbs with his hand and on the occasion uttered this inspired utterance. The Blessed One showed compassion towards me in regard to uh, both kinds of good, the good pertaining to the present life and that pertaining to the future life. So uh, over here, there is a uh, note by Bhikkhu Bodhi. We'll go through that note. My internet is a little slow. So the note uh, kind of, uh, I, I'll just uh, uh, tell the note by memory. Uh, the note was about uh, how the king reduced. The king uh, was eating a bucket full of food. So then he uh, started eating three fourths uh, full of uh, food. Then he started eating half uh, a bucket. Then he uh, reduced it further. So in this way, uh, as and when uh, uh, this uh, 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 every day or every uh, uh, time period, a fixed time period, he started reducing his intake of food. In that way, slowly, slowly, one uh, is uh, uh, expected to uh, reduce their uh, uh, kind of uh, indulgence in something which uh, one is indulging in. So there is a kind of a, a, a path over here, the Buddha is showing that uh, you can do this in a gradual manner and in a gradual way. In the same way that the uh, teaching of the Dhamma is also there, in a gradual manner, in a gradual way, in the same way, you can use this to uh, on your other uh, attachments, other uh, defilements which uh, one person has. 
uh, one can use that on those things also and uh, achieve good uh, uh, results in life, which is kind of practical. So that is the reason the uh, king says that he is happy that he is uh, being taught something which is immediately effective. That was the health aspect. But why is he saying that it is helpful in the future? Because this also is the practical ap application of the uh, mindfulness or six hours, as we say, as a, a whole right effort. Uh, when you recognize, you release, you re relax, uh, re-smile, return and remain, uh, repeat when needed. So this is the way uh, one can use the uh, practically uh, the application or the teaching of the Buddha in the daily life. So this is a very short uh, sutta uh, for today. One second, Sister Kema is calling. Maybe <laughs> I can ask her to come. Uh, you may pause the uh, recording for now. Pause the recording. Yeah. Uh, it says that I render pint pot uh, is the proper portion for a man. That is what uh, has been said. And he said that uh, that word itself is a little difficult to uh, translate. And uh, he could not find any source specifying the re re relationship between Dona and Nilanka. So he speaks that the Buddha had instructed Suddhadvana to recite the verse not when the king began his meal, but when he approached the end. In this way, each day the king gradually left aside the last portion of food until he reached the proper measure. So this is, uh, I think, uh, a commentary. Certain times commentary kind of give uh, elaboration or uh, give a, a clarification, which is not uh, given in uh, this thing, uh, the sutta. And uh, uh, we have to take this in a, with a pinch of salt because uh, uh, it has it is a post facto kind of uh, 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 kind of explanation in many cases. Uh, so <coughs> certain at times what happens is that. Uh, there is a uh, uh, clarification which matches the other suttas. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, certain times they give a clarification about uh, say dependent origination or uh, like uh, about uh, certain uh, dhamma uh, uh, points which matches the other suttas. Those, uh, those uh, commentaries kind of we are accepting. Uh, but there are certain commentaries there, uh, there is a kind of, a, a, it goes against the other sutta uh, where it has been explicitly explained that this thing is not possible. Like uh, uh, there is a, uh, many of the uh, places where uh, I think Bhikkhu uh, Nyanananda uh, uh, mentions about Nibbana. The explanation of Nibbana while given in uh, many of the commentaries do not match the uh, suttas itself. Mm. They are contradictory. So mm. that, is, that you have to be careful about. So we just finished that sutta as I explained to you. So mm. if you want to take up something else or a small sutta, I think uh, you should... Uh... Small sutta. <laughs> Yeah, I'm so sorry. I um, have been very sick for two, three days now, and I'm having fun with the uh, curd and rice and um, just the medications the doctors have given me, and I can't seem to eat anything else. 
So I'm living just fine for moderation on a half a cup of rice and about a cup of curd each morning and then a half a cup of rice and curd in the day. So I think I pass the test for moderation now completely. <laughs> you know, the, and, in the suttas has been mentioned that curd as a medicine. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, traditionally, mm -hmm. uh, it, has been, uh, it has been mentioned uh, that is, that is, that is the, the medicine in this case. That's what everybody wants me to do. Okay, I, went, I was going to talk to you about um, uh, government stuff, but do you, I'm wondering if you, if we have time because um, we go uh, 2.30 to 3 o'clock. So let's see where we are here. Um, how many of you, how, have I ever read to you the, um, the Bojanga Samyutta, how much of that is actually talking about hindrances? And it's talking many, many things about hindrances. It's talking not just about the discussion that I told you, but also, um, let's see, I'm losing this for a minute. There, here we go. Um, Um, geez, I can't find the section in the Samyutta Bhanti. I can't find the Samyutta Nikaya. Um, <laughs> wait, let's see that. I remember that. That's a page number? Well, 15, 1597 was, I think, the page for the discussion, but it was what was coming before that that was really interesting to me. 15. Mm -hmm. How much? Oh, my neighbor's dogs. Okay. Let's see. First of all, you've heard me talk to you before about how the. Um, The discussion about the hindrances in direct relationship to the arising or the non arising of the enlightenment factors and the enlightenment factors or awakening factors, they are important for you uh, to have them arise and become balanced before you can fall into uh, naturally fall into the state of cessation. And um, here, wait a second, here we go. There, when you get to 1597 in the um, Samhita Nikaya, there's a number of patient pages that are happening before that, that are talking about corruption of mind. And there are some similes that go through. He talks about and then it talks about being having these hindrances be present and having them not be present and the difference it makes. And so we get this picture that this issue, and I think uh, the issue is the biggest one for meditators today. Whether they are practicing tranquil wisdom insight meditation or breathing meditation, it really doesn't make any difference when we're talking about hindrances. We're talking about how these are getting in the way of us when we are practicing our meditation. And we've talked several times here about the words that are stressed in many writings about the hindrances, uh, the idea that they, we should be at war with them and that our attempt should be to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, suffocate them, suppress them, subdue them, um, and, and we should make them stop. The first thing that should come to your mind when we're saying something like that 
I should try to do this, which logically is contrary to the idea that you are practicing to learn to work in an impersonal way rather than a personal way. So you are trying to develop anatta perspective in your practice, in everything that regards your practice. So if somebody is giving you instructions, the first thing that should come to your mind if you had any anatta teaching, if you had the anatta's teaching is why, I don't think this is quite right, perhaps to apply myself to try to make this stop. That should be the first thing, even if you have none of the other knowledge that we've given you concerning these hindrances um, in, in why they're so important for the enlightened factors, even if I didn't say that to you, if you knew about the anatta approach, that the perspective that you're living with, how you choose to see things quickly, that's what your perspective is. Do you immediately think, oh, this is terrible, this is awful, this is horrible? Or do you go, oh, this is going to be a challenge. What do we need to do to solve it? <laughs> you know, these two different people, you see, with two different ways of seeing something very quickly. And the universe is telling us that the anatta approach of taking things impersonally is the way the universe helps you to make everything work the right way. Doesn't matter if you're waiting, if you're trying to um, figure out what to do next. If you're struggling, you may have heard people say this to you. If you're trying to make a decision about what to do next, if you are struggling and everything you try to do the way you're thinking it ought to work is not working, it's just coming in your face falling down, failing again and again. It's time to look at another way of looking at it and see if you go that way instead of this way, will it work better? So the universe is giving you a signal. That's not it. That's not it. That's not it. <laughs> and then finally, we, we are told in Buddhism, okay, what was that? <laughs> And that was the personal way of trying to make it stop. It's not working. Now, we have to look at the linguistic idea when we're at linguistics closely and the translation work that's been done into English concerning this whole thing. Because watch me, watch me babble for a minute. <laughs> okay, here is a hindrance and I'm told we have to destroy it, annihilate it, eradicate it, suppress it, subdue it, and make it stop. So that's our objective, is to be practicing without the hindrance. Is it true or false? It's true. We, that's the, that is the, the destination. We want it to be destroyed, annihilated, eradicated, and not be able to come up anymore. That's true. But when I turn it into something I actively have to personally do, the question is, is there another way to handle this so that it becomes destroyed, annihilated, and eradicated permanently? And that's where it gets fun. For many, 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 many years, maybe 50, 100 years, nobody has been talking about the hindrances, very few people where you don't have to make this thing stop. And here I come, oh boy, <laughs> here I come and I'm looking through everything and I'm saying, but wait a minute, there's another set of words in the text. And what is the other set of words in the text? That's the key to this whole story. We need to relinquish them, release them, uh, abandon them, allow them, just let them be and not try to do anything to them and they'll just fade away. So the world over here is not listening <laughs> and we still have this matter 
of the hindrances and uh, the personal experience of like spiritual death that people go through, that's the context of the dark night of the soul that you hear about. Well, the Buddha wasn't asking you to disappear. I want to make this clear. He was not asking you to pretend there is no self and go out there and get confused about that. He was trying to get you to consider, just consider logically with deductive reasoning, how things could be different if you looked at the consequence of there was no self. Now, if there is no self and this person is going through life, then the Im no self or the impersonal approach to everything impersonally would be different from the other one. You get, you get where I am? You, are you with me? Okay. Okay. So if I look at this obstruction, this, this um, hindrance, this, this, this uh, ob obstacle obstruction, the hindrance, the uh, distraction, disturbance, the obstacle the, uh, that's coming up, you see, if I, I, do I have a choice how I'm going to view it? That's where you ask yourself and the question, you, you do have a choice. This is where it gets confusing if you don't have somebody to help you steer just briefly through the rapids as you're going down the river, <laughs> just briefly help you to steer, to understand. We're not saying you should not exist because if you didn't exist, well, the ship would hit the rocks and that'd be the end of the whole trip, <laughs> okay? But we're giving you the boat and we're saying you are in charge, personally responsible to steer the boat down the river, the stream to the ocean. You're responsible for this. Nobody else is gonna get up there and steer your boat. So you make the choice, the intention of which way am I gonna look at things? Am I gonna look at everything in a down dark way? Or am I going to let that go? And I'm going to look up instead and decide that even for just one day, Everything is going to be pink instead of black and brown and gray. I'll tell you a story. When I was 41, I had a very serious breakdown. And when I was in the hospital, one of the things they did was they asked us to paint a picture. And we could uh, take the paper and look at a picture and try and draw it and paint it, or we could just draw it. Now, the thing was, at the time when this happened, when they asked us to do that, I looked at a beautiful color picture, but all I could see was gray and browns and blacks, but it was a color painting. It took me many years to find out that I was not insane, that this had happened to a lot of other people. When you have a complete breakdown like, uh, like this happened, um, you can lose your sense of seeing color, but it came back. It came back because of relief from a, a method of relief on the concerns and the idea of hope. At that time, there wasn't much to cling to, but there was hope that it could come back from this because at first I couldn't walk. Then I could walk just from a room to another room to eat. If I held a banister going down the hall and then uh, get back and just sit in a chair or lay in a bed, I couldn't do almost anything for a week or so. Then it got a little better. I could go and sit with a group where everybody talked about the gray, the black, and the dark. And I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to something else. We knew I was successful from one day we all got on a bus and went to buy one thing where we had to be around people and I couldn't be around people very long. I couldn't be there around people more than 10, 15 minutes, but at the, some people went into this one store. It was a department store. I went into the first thing I could find were slippers. 
and I had the money to buy slippers. And what did I do? I bought bright pink slippers. <laughs> And they considered that like a 10 on the scale when we got back. Other people were buying like a black shirt, a brown shirt, a gray shirt, a dark gray shirt, <laughs> you know, or a hat that was really, really dark. And I go back with, what did you get? I said, bright pink slippers. When I went home after this happened, I'll tell you the first thing I did, was I emptied my closet and threw out all my clothes and I went to a used clothing store and bought color. <laughs> I just decided today I was gonna be Picasso and I went and I bought color. And color has a lot to do with our mind. If you wear black all the time, you think it's really cool actually, well, it's not cool for one thing, but beyond not being cool, it's dark. So we had a woman once come to a retreat and the woman came and she was just very plain, you know, and here she was an important, uh, you know, kingpin in an office manager position at a university. And she was wearing plain grace, plain green, plain this, plain that. And what did Bonte tell her to do? He gave her one day off to go shopping. She had to come back with color. And she went and she bought a cotton outfit, top and skirt that was just knock your socks off. I mean, it was like parrots and, and beautiful uh, fauna, you know, and, and fa uh, what do you call it? Ferns and palm leaves and beautiful painted parrots on this dress. It was gorgeous. And you know what? When she came back for her interview wearing that, she was smiling. Yeah, she was smiling. And the thing is, it's like nobody gave her permission to just go outside the boundaries of this ridiculous protocol thing. And then everybody, of course, let her have this afterwards. They let her dress better in, in the office. She just took off with the idea. So clothes, do clothes make the man? Do clothes make the woman? Well, I don't know if it changes you and your cape or your professional abilities and stuff, but when you walk in that room, you better believe that if you have the right uh, colors for what it is you want to have happen when you go for that meeting things are going to change for you so this is like a message i had a zen pre a zen teacher never wore anything but black he argued with me that black is the presence of all colors mixed together <laughs> Yeah, but if we go to the to the personal management book on behavior and the and the uh, the uh, measurement of color, you know that how it impacts you. There's different ratings for different colors. One of the secrets I can tell you, it's not a secret. It's actually a well-known fact, probably from the 1700s, is if you go and get a big piece, a big piece of pink rose quartz, rose quartz. Go and get two chunks of rose quartz. Take them home and if people are arguing in your house or the kids are fighting in one of the rooms, don't put them in the open. Put them on the mantelpiece behind a picture. I don't care where you put them and we don't care how this works. <laughs> but if you do this, everybody will stop arguing and the kids will calm down immediately in the room pink rose quartz has this effect on people. Another one is um, salmon. Salmon is a, uh, it's not, what is it? Salmon color is not pink, but it's not orange. It's sort of in between a salmon color. If you can find a salmon color and paint your walls, you will immediately feel better. You will be, you'll be calm when you come home from work. This room is kind of, um, sort of, I don't know if you can, let me see if you can see it. I don't know if you can um, identify or not, but let me take this off for a minute and, and see where I really am. Um, see, oh, you can't really see it with those lights, can you? Yeah, well, 
Let me see. Can you see it? But this, this room was done that way. It was a salmon color. And it was uh, hard to, I had to go to the paint shop and blend it, <laughs> you know, to get them to, to have it for me. But they had the, the color mixed chart was there. We could make it. The reason for the salmon color, the first time I ever met that color was in a chiropractic office. Nobody was suffering in that <laughs> chiropractic office. They were sitting in the front waiting to have their backs, uh, you know, the, the manipulations done in their back adjustments. And they were so calm, so peaceful. So anyway, coming back to this, our perspective changes everything for us. And it's only, we're the only ones that can choose our perspective. So when the person comes to me and they say, yeah, but I don't want to smile because I don't feel like smiling. You know what I tell them. You guys know what I tell them. I don't care if you don't feel like it, smile anyway, because of the muscle thing that exists from here, running up here into here, and it goes into your head and separates the two parts of the brain up here. And that really it sets the pineal gland takes the pressure off the pineal gland. And that allows endorphins or dopamine or endorphins to come in those um, types of, uh, uh, right, those types of things come into the brain, which allows you to feel lighter. And you take a hold of that and you have a choice. So everybody has a choice when they come to a, uh, come to the where the road separates. Yeah? Which way did you go? Did you go this way because you always have? Or did you go this way over here and take the load, the road less traveled? And taking the road less traveled can be interesting. Challenge yourself. Try it. Yeah? And see. So next week I'm going to see Everett with a pink scarf around his neck. <laughs> <laughs> get a bright hot pink scarf around your neck i'll get one too if i can find one i am suffering right now because i can't find my old one that i have to get a towel and double it up and put it around just to i do it i take the towel and i wrap it all up so it's bunched up like this see like that and then i pour the water in until the ice water in and then wrap it around my neck and then i get cooler <laughs> Okay, but um, we are going to remedy this. I just found out last night that um, I'm going to be doing a tour in Europe, and this is really going to be fun because it's going to be 10 and 15 people in these retreats, and it's going to be in different places, but it will be primarily, it will be based in Gdansk, uh, Poland. Gdansk, Poland, yeah. And so that, that will start happening. Uh, in May by the last, uh, the let's see, May 15th. So the last two weekends probably of May, there will be uh, retreats. And I don't have all the information yet, but I'll give it to you as soon as we set it. We, we set up the venue and everything. So that's actually happening. And I'll be doing that from <clears throat> the middle of, uh, by the 15th of May, uh, all the way till the end of July is when I'll be doing it. So wish me luck on that. Okay, so <clears throat> this one um, in here, talking about the hindrances, there are a lot of small pieces here. Listen to this one, careful attention. Now this is in, in the Bojanga Samyutta, this is number 35. And then in Colons it says five, careful attention. Monks, when one attends carelessly, unarisen sensual desire arises, and arisen sensual desire increases and it expands. Unarisen ill will will arise, and the arisen ill will increases and expands. The unarisen sloth and torpor will arise, and arisen sloth and torpor will increase and expand. An unarisen restlessness and remorse will arise, 
and a risen restlessness and a remorse increase and expand. Unarisen doubt arises and the arisen doubt increases and expands. This is taking the five hindrances explaining to you what happens if it arises and, what, and how um, it increases and expands. Now, when one attends carefully, the unarisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness arises and the arisen enlightenment factor of mindfulness goes to fulfillment by development when you have careful attention. So careless attention, when they're talking that, that first paragraph, when they're talking about that, they're talking careless attention means that I move over to it and pay attention to it, then it, it, it increases and it expands. This is what's happening here. And then the, it says the enlightenment factor of uh, all the seven enlightenment factors, which would be your investigation enlightenment factor, your uh, energy enlightenment factor, your joy uh, enlightenment factor, and then the tranquility factor, the concentration level, that one, that factor is out of balance. And then the last one is um, equanimity. Your equanimity cannot come to fulfillment. So if you are paying attention to any of those basic hindrances, there can be other hindrances. You want to see what they are. You go to Majima Nikai number 128 to Upak Kalesa Sutta, and you will see that there are 11 listed there. These five are there, but there's more. There's, there's um, six more that are listed there. And they are basically components. When you see the increased number of hindrances, usually you can come back to the five and then consider the subcomponents of five. And then those show up to be making up the 11 that I think that are in the 128. That's how that all works. And so they're just saying that this is going to uh, always, um, it's going to, with careless attention, it is going to just increase and it's going to happen again and again. And what I'm doing now is trying to explain a little bit about how uh, in what I'm starting to write, Let's go back there a little bit, see if they still have it there. Um, starting to write, make this here for a minute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'll read you just a little bit of what it is that I'm working on with um, the front part of a, uh, a book getting into this. I don't, let me, let me put this down. I have to go down here. I always have to walk myself through this to remember how to do it. Uh, and then I'm gonna take it, the hindrance project. <clears throat> okay, and when we go back to the um, the beginning of this, um, okay, this is in the front part of this. Whoops. <clears throat> There's a big introduction into this explaining why I'm writing this book. And uh, you can listen to the front part of this in just a little bit. Um, this book is basically about the most, and you can tell your friends because <laughs> we talk about this a lot here. And I really think it's one of the most important things to talk about. The book is about the most devilish, irritating, confounding things that arise in your mind for what seems like no reason at all while you are trying to meditate. It happens to everyone when they begin to practice meditation, and it's about the hindrances. 
these aggravating little visitors keep you from progressing in your meditation and nobody ever tells you much about who they are, how they work, why they come up, what keeps them there, what in the world we're supposed to do about them. It is with deep love and respect that I'm writing to you today to reveal an unusual piece of the Buddha Dhamma. I'm asking you to keep an open mind. I am requesting that if you find something that makes sense when you try it and it helps your meditation, you will share it with others to help them too and get them to try it. All of which I share with you now will help mankind move closer to logic and peace. And if you share this and they read it and experiment with this material for themselves, then everyone will begin to smile when they find out for a fact how distractions in your meditation arise, what makes them come up and how this can stop. So then everyone will feel better. And this is, we were talking about, um, we, will, we were talking about um, how to uh, speak, weren't we talking about this last time, about how to talk to people about Buddhist teaching without it being Buddhist. We were talking about that. And this is, this is an extension of that when you look at how this is done. Well, what if I told you there is a way to eliminate distractions permanently? And you would probably first tell me I was mad, <laughs> but I'm not because eliminating your hindrances can be accomplished by learning how they actually operate, what makes them tick, what supports them, and how you can send them packing because they can't survive anymore if they don't get any more nutriment. Much of this information is gonna sound new to you, but the material is not new. It's as old as the Buddha's suttas. And although it's always been in plain sight in the lessons the Buddha taught his own monks, we have been living through a time when almost nobody looks closely at what the Buddha told his own monks about this issue. After he left us by going into Parinibbana, it wasn't too long before the followers left, followed a different road when it came to ending distractions in your practice. As meditators, a large group of us today rely on books that try to tell us what the Buddha meant instead of going to read for themselves and test out what he told us to do. We leave behind a lot of his own advice. And in my opinion, that's a mistake because we missed what I'm talking about here. Because he left us specific information and not just a little bit, a lot. And going back to his source is where there are answers how to live a better life, how to meditate more successfully and usefully, how to succeed at home, in school, business, and government, how to live and how to die calmly and peacefully. When it comes to our own training today and any struggle with distractions during meditation, he told us far more than we have ever heard before. And this is what I want to share with you. I've been studying and practicing tranquil wisdom, insight meditation, and how it operates now for over 20 years. And I feel that no one can say this is what the Buddha did today. The only thing anybody can say is what operates well for us in daily life after we leave a retreat and continue living day to day. That's all we can say. There's something significant that happens and probably that was happening too back then. What operates well to help us train our minds to avoid suffering in our, in our routine life appears to me to be the most important thing for people in this modern time. Much of our suffering can be avoided and life can become much lighter 
once we understand how we human beings actually operate when it comes to our mind and body and feelings and emotions. So I do know for a fact that there is a practice that has very similar results to what is described in the early Buddhist texts. I have experienced it for years myself, and it takes a little time to refine some of the definitions that we've been taught in other places so that all the pieces this practice can fit together like a perfect jigsaw puzzle. To discover this clearly, we have to be willing to retune some previous ideas we had at first about meditation, mindfulness, delusion, craving, clinging, purification, and retraining of the mind. All of this is revealed in the text. We need to return there to learn about the original potential for understanding the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, and the three characteristics of existence in such a way that we can readily see in the beginning there was an interwoven Dhamma cloth. Once we see the pieces clearly connected and apply them with this understanding, the results are stunning. Our practice will no longer suffer inertia. We take our meditation and continue on into life. And by applying it beyond the boundaries of retreats, we will repeatedly purify and train our brains until they take up the cleansing practice the Buddha left for us. Our minds will shortly begin to automatically support this practice in all the situations in life. By the Buddha's own words, if you go to MN95, the Chanki Sutta, it seemed very logical to me as a student to question everything. I was instructed to do and test out whatever it was true or not. I was lucky enough to have a teacher who encouraged this and asking questions produces new knowledge and wisdom. As a past Christian for many years, what excited me first was the discovery that one does not have to die to get to heaven. With correct knowledge of how the human mind and body work, one can virtually become free from most mental and physical sufferings. Each day of our life, we can, we have the potential to create a heaven or a hell on earth. We see that this is totally up to us when we understand the basics of this teaching. It turns out nothing is happening to us. Nothing ever did. Everything is happening from us. This new evolution is revolutionary. So I owe a great debt to my teacher, Bhante Bimala Ramsey, because he didn't promise me anything. He did not save me. He showed me how to stop personally inflicting suffering onto myself like most people do today. He simply did his job as a good monk and he pointed. He said to try it and see what happens. And therefore, I decided to follow the instructions he read for us directly out of the lessons the Buddha taught without much argument. And these early texts called suttas in Pali gave the answers to everything he wanted to know, he wanted us to know. Once you get used to listening to them, you begin to hear the precise recipe for escaping suffering. And we began to practice that recipe and as a result, many students started to live again and they began to smile and lighten up in this pressured, busy, fast world, paced world. At first, I don't know how lucky I was to have the English speaking teacher, well-trained for years in Burma, Thailand and Malaysia. But one of the first things he taught me about in the Buddha Dhamma was the following chant. Sandatiko, Akaliko, Eipasiko, Opanaiko. 
Hachitang Wedi Tabo Winu Iti. The meaning of the chant is what kept my practice going all these years. The Sanditiko is visible here and now. Akaliko, untouched by time or timeless, immediately effective without delay. Ei Pasiko, inviting deeper inspection. O Panayiko, leading onward down the noble inward path. And Pachitam Tabo Winuiti, to be personally experienced by the wise. Now, don't worry about whether you are wise enough to learn it or not, because I will tell you as I go along what this word means within the text. It's a bit different. Recovering the truth to these phrases became a persistent dedication to investigation and discovery. And simply put, I wanted to know how to relieve the most difficult challenge anyone faces when they practice meditation with an intention to move down the Buddhist path to experience Nibbana. I wanted to see clearly how to end the hindrances. And that's all I'm going to read for you now. But uh, I want to, uh, that's an introduction into it, trying to get you to understand why I'm putting this together. Inside of this, there's going to be 11 full suttas for you to play with. Inside the, the 11 suttas we talk about that are existing, that we look at most often, so that you can see this is not me talking through my hat. You know, this is just telling you. You can't fix something if you don't understand how it works. So I guess if someone said to me, like, where should I go and what should I look for if I study with a teacher? The one thing I would say to them is when you go to learn meditation, try to find out as quickly as possible, are they going to teach you meditation and are they going to teach you the Dhamma that supports it at the same time? Because that's what you really need. Because the Buddha's measurement, his own measurement for being successful or, you know, making progress, his, his modes of progress stated very clearly, it's not just how well you're practicing the meditation, how long you can sit. That's not what it's about. It's about what you're actually doing in the meditation and having the comprehension of the Dhamma on one parallel piece and the development of the meditation on the other parallel piece. If you do that, then you're going to start to see how many ways can we actually use this in life. Yeah? So let me throw it out to the floor for just a couple minutes here. We have, we'll stay till four, I guess, <laughs> you know, uh, for 10 minutes anyway. But do you understand what I'm getting at with this book, the way I'm trying to do it? Yeah? And we've talked about this a lot here. Um, anybody have any questions about the hindrances and uh, what we should be do, what we should do with them? Anybody? Yeah, me. Oh, thank you, Sister Kema, for sharing that. That was very nice introduction. Um, just a quick question about the hindrances uh, and it connects with the reading that you just had on careful attention. I guess in the beginning, um, our mindfulness may not be strong yet. And I guess the whole purpose of the, sorry, not sharp yet. So I guess the whole purpose of the entire practice is to sharpen our mindfulness to the point where um, of course, in the actual uh, formal sitting, uh, we can try to observe when the hindrance arrive, but we should not stop there. We should test ourselves to see in our day-to-day -day activities, how quickly uh, can we observe any kind of hindrance arise uh, throughout the day or carry us away. And uh, I think the introduction about food uh, was a very nice segue uh, into this. I, that's just my, my, my personal feeling because food is a um, very, everyone can relate to food as a, as a, 
I don't know if it's a hindrance. It's like a two two sides of the same coin kind of thing. Well, we need I'll tell you, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. We need yeah. food to sustain. But sure. there is always, everyone is like battling with what's the fine line between enough for sustainment and health and indulgence, I guess. Ah, now we get to Jenny Craig. <laughs> Jenny Craig uh, diet system I went on many years ago and the first uh, couple weeks of Jenny Craig every time you go in they give you this uh, little presentation and you do like about six or seven chapters of it one of the chapters in this was about how do we know how much food to eat okay and um when you're eating you start to eat because you're hungry but then you have to sense when you've had enough. So you have, this is a detection. There's first of all, determining how much food do I need? Now you can also train yourself to the bowl. I mean, I will tell you this, you can train yourself uh, to the bowl when you're using the bowl and just make a mark in the bowl that you only want that much food in it or take a very small bowl like this big and just eat that much is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> you know, and if you do that, regularly enough and you have a fairly active life, you're gonna lose weight just fine. But what she was trying to get across to people is you have a detection system in your, in your body uh, that tells you uh, when you have enough, you have enough and you stop at that point. And you have to, you're, what you're watching for, of course, is the increase in tension, a little bit of tension. I want more of that ice cream. <laughs> you know, I want more, <laughs> you know, but do, you're wanting, you're trying to get to this, I need it, I want it, the difference between that, needing sustenance and starting to eat food, you should be eating slowly. One of the things the Buddha talks about, and I think it's the basket, the medicine basket, we have, I have that because Bhante gave it to me, uh, and in reading in there's Javaka's notes about, you shouldn't be, um, eating fast and you should and this is this is a problem for our monks in modern times is everything's moving so fast in our lives so we're a big temple and the monks are not supposed to finish before the abbot finishes when the abbot finishes everybody is done so if you have an abbot that's in a hurry to go somewhere after lunch you're out of luck <laughs> because he's going <laughs> You know, and when he's done, you have to stop eating. That's the rule, you know, and I've been in temples where there's nine or 10 of us in a row, and then we see he's done, that's it. And then he's going to say the blessing and go to his meeting, <laughs> you know, but it's not supposed to be working that way. Uh, this lunch thing, the meal, the one meal a day is supposed to be a cooperative thing. And the monks are supposed to first, when you are eating, to stop this shoveling thing that people do. And it's why they get so, so much weight is you're eating too fast. You're not chewing your food. And the misunderstanding about why do I have to chew my food until the size of a piece of rice in my mouth. And no matter what you're eating, no matter whether it's meat or fish or anything, you have to chew it. And here's the rule, you chew it until you feel the saliva start to come into your mouth. If you study digestion, you will begin to understand it consists of a lot of fluids, the digestive system, and the beginning of it is in your mouth. And so if you're putting food in and you're swallowing it and food in and swallowing it, you see, and if you're just putting it in and going, mm, 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 swallow, mm, 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 swallow, mm, 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 swallow, if you're doing that, you're not waiting in time. Now, this is real. I didn't believe it, <laughs> but I was traveling, driving for Bunty across the country. He'd make me sit there and chew my food until I could sense the saliva coming and that's the beginning of the digesting of the food and then you swallow it now this is going to clear up a lot of problems for people with digestive problems and gastrointestinal problems because they're going to chew the food and the buddha said chew it until it's the size of a piece of rice chew it that small so if you do that with everything 
think how good that is, and then you go slow enough, you'll feel that moist, that fluid come in, and then you swallow, and everything works much better. When you feel to the level where you've had enough, you will feel that if you take another bite, there's a kind of tension that happens. And that is something you're looking for. If there's a little bit of tension, there's a little bit of craving coming up. I want more. That's what this is. Now, this is very hard for somebody from Philadelphia to listen to talk about when we like to have our um, steak and cheese sandwiches that are world famous, steak and cheese and onions that are done on the grill, and they put them in this big thing. And you know what? You don't need to eat that big thing. May and I could eat that big thing, or three of us could eat that big bun. You know, you don't need it, but you're on a vacation and you really want it, and oh my, <laughs> you know, you know, but generally speaking, this is how you learn to control. These signs are there in your body, okay? That's really there. So part of, part of eating, that's what's going on. Yeah. So um, Bhante used to say, that it's not necessary for you to like what they put in your bowl. He used to tell me, he told me before I went to Sri Lanka, just be sure that somebody gives you some bananas and then just cut up those bananas, put them in no matter what's in the bowl, just eat the what's in the bowl. <laughs> So you put it in and, and if you're doing it properly, whatever people put in your bowl, you know, nowadays the, some people put things in little plastic containers and they put them in your bowl. They're not supposed to do that. They're supposed to put a few bite, a few spoonfuls of something in your bowl. You just stir it all up and you mash the potato, the, the bananas and just put them in there and stir them up. And that's it. It's all going to the same place. Uh, this makes my mother and my grandmother, I can, sense them squirming in their grave because you're supposed to eat one bite of each thing around the plate, you see. <laughs> so now I can say one bite at a time, very delicately around the plate and keep going like that till you, uh, and I didn't do that at college. When I left, it was over. <laughs> you know? But um, so what I'm saying is stir it all up, eat what's in your bowl, you go and clean your bowl. You don't give your bowl to someone else to clean. You go and clean your bowl. Set it up for tomorrow if you're staying at the temple in a, in a little spot, and then you do your meal again. And in the morning, you can get your bowl and have just a couple things in the bowl, or you can take a small, um, you know, take a small, um, what do you call it? Right. <laughs> like a donut and just eat it, you know, or a piece of bread and eat it. That's all you, for breakfast, you need. You really, you are breaking fast. You are breaking fast and you don't need a lot of food for breakfast. So you just do that and you keep, you keep working, <laughs> you keep working and uh, you're, you're occupied. So that's the story about food. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Je the Jen Craig program was a very interesting program. I learned two things from that. I'll confess to you, I lost 71 pounds when I did that. It was way long time ago. But one thing that was very enlightening is I don't have to go up and down the aisles of the food store. That all food stores in the world are set up the same way. And they, they studied this. So your dairy and your vegetables and your uh, meat, fish, all the kind of things that are your protein and the lentils and everything, they will be around the edge of the store. And you're, you'll find the milk and you'll find the juices. You'll find, still to this day, you will find uh, the yogurt, everything. And it will be on the outside uh, circle of the store. It, you don't have to go up and down the aisles. And you know, when we have children, we really like to know that we don't have to go up and down the aisles because they want to grab the candy and grab the cookies and all kinds of stuff. So that was enlightening to me that I, that I thought, oh, that's impossible. I have to go up and down the aisles. You might have to reach into one aisle to get the cat food or the dog food. You know, you might have to do that. And, so, and the soups are always on the end of the aisle so that you don't have to go into the aisle um, 
it's only when you have to get unusual stuff that you have to go into the aisles. So I, I just thought it was interesting. Nobody had ever pointed that out to me before. Hmm? So check it out, check it out for yourself, okay? Anybody else got any questions? Hmm? Ah, going once. <laughs> you got one, Everett? What's your question? You're uh, thinking. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just uh, curious about the book and curious about where hindrances come from. So, but that's probably a big one, right? Well, what are the hindrances? Well, for for me, I, I, I'm i not, not, well, it, it seems like. Well, but I mean, go that, below, go below. You don't have to pinpoint it, but yeah. below, uh, deductive, deduce, Underneath that, logically, what is a hindrance? It's something to do with craving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's a it's a desire or an aversion. It's an attachment or an aversion that's happening and coming out of you while you're practicing. And and how the other thing when do you remember I told you? Remember I told you once that I was going to be an attorney just to defend the hindrance in court. You remember I told you that? And I said, I'm going to take it to court and prove you cannot send the hindrance to jail. You shouldn't have a war with it, first of all. You shouldn't even have a fight with it. Because the thing is, the hindrance is actually innocent. So when you get into this book more, I try to, to get you to understand. When you, you ask the right question, how does the hindrance come up? And this is coming from me. So what am I doing that allows that hindrance to come up when I'm meditating? So let's look at first the components of what you're doing when you're meditating. So you're, you have the mindfulness, which is the objective, is to um, watch and see clearly the arising and passing away of all phenomena and understanding how they work. That's your your, your objective and to get to the clearest mind you possibly can in the process of meditation. The mindfulness is your actual, the actual skill of observing how you do that, how, you're, um, how you, how you um, sense this, how do you detect it, how do you understand it working. So now what's the component for a person to do good meditation? Okay, the five faculties, faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom is the learning about how those work. Okay, so you have to have faith that the that the Buddha, you put your faith in the Buddha found something. This is what I did. The Buddha, let's say this, this man found something. I mean, I was at my wit's end and I just thought, why not try one more thing? <laughs> so I, I decided, let's go in this temple and find out if this person knew anything about anything. And I, that's my, that was the extent of my faith in this in the beginning. Then when I had the teacher and I knew I had the teacher, I put my faith that this person knows what is, what is, really, uh, what is really going on. And so I put my faith in the teacher. That was, uh, you need to remind me uh, to do that sutta next week because in the sutta I was going to do, what was it? 16, it's 16, uh, 137, 137. You remind me to do that next week, 137. Okay, the question is, is the teacher understand? the Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination, and the Three Characteristics clearly. If you feel that I know them very clearly, then you put your faith in me that I can explain them to you well enough that you can experience them clearly too. So that's what you're doing. Okay, the next piece is um, the energy in your practice. Energy in meditation is just for you to keep up your energy, faith, energy, mindfulness, is your observation skill. You have to, the energy keeps the observation skill going, right? On your object of meditation, okay? 
okay? All right, faith, energy, mindfulness. The concentration you use, the collectedness of mind has to be a productive level of concentration. And what did the Buddha consider a productive level of concentration? What did the Buddha consider good meditation to be? He said, meditation that reaches the path easily and helps you go down the path is good meditation. So when we say faith, energy, mindfulness, um, concentration has to be a productive level, but not too tight and not too loose. Otherwise, you won't be able to watch what's happening inside properly. So now here comes a hindrance. Wow, 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 it's here. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. And the hindrance is here. And But you're watching, you're watching your spiritual friend. So now what happens, the hindrance just came out of the mind. You didn't make, you didn't produce it, stop and produce it. It just came up from stuff that's rumbling around in your mind, stuff you think about, all kinds of stuff. It just comes out of your brain. We are not, when we're meditating, we are not working to stop our brain from producing thoughts. It doesn't, that's not what we're doing. We're not trying to do that. I think that's where the suppression stuff came from, but that's not correct thinking. You, your mind slows down and stops producing stuff as you start meditating more clearly, more powerfully observing. It doesn't come up so often because why? Because you're not going to pay attention to it. That's why, because you take away its food. But here is this hindrance and it wants to get you. So what is it that makes you, how, this is your question, how do I leave my object of meditation and go over to that hindrance, right? How does that happen? Well, your energy slips and your mindfulness slips. And in mindfulness, there's a couple of components. Your interest in the object of meditation, you're getting bored of it a little tiny bit subconsciously. That looks like what's more interesting is this over here, okay? <laughs> so now you're, you're at a point where something's gonna happen where the, where the energy, the faith, the energy and the mind, you gave up faith and this instructions, you gave that up and your interest fell, your, your uh, energy and your mindfulness, one of the components of it is your personal interest in this, interest in your spiritual friend. And if the, if your interest slips in your person, your, have you heard me say to people, well, if you let your spiritual friend go, when that happened, what you're describing, well, where's your spiritual friend? Didn't you like him? You didn't like him anymore, so you left him. You stopped working with him, or you didn't. You weren't interested in sending to the directions in the universe, loving kindness. You didn't care about all the people in the universe, so you, you didn't. You weren't interested enough to stay with that idea. So where are you going to go? Well, we got this little person. Ah inside of us it's on yo human beings and it's curiosity and guess what curiosity killed the cat you know <laughs> but curiosity is what's going to make you give up watching this spiritual friend and move over to find hey what are you where did you come from why are you here and then you start now watch this you were practicing a meditation where you were sending to your spiritual friend. But now you just moved over here to investigate and analyze who are you? Where'd you come from? What are you about? So tell me, are you still continuing the meditation with your spiritual friend? Or did you move over here and start another meditation with this other friend? <laughs> and you're gonna figure out where'd you come from? How long are you gonna stay? Do you want tea? <laughs> you know this kind of thing over here. So see what we're talking about here. You, you opened the door to this and this is real. Was it the hindrances fault that you moved over here? Or were you at fault by not keeping up these, that's why we have faith, energy, mindfulness, concentration and wisdom. You are the one that's responsible for that. And how come I'm responsible for it? Because that's your ship. 
and you have to steer it. So now you can't do this. This is where I get a student who says, yes, but I have no self. Who's supposed to go over there? <laughs> you know, and that's where there's a misunderstanding. I didn't really say there was no, no Evert uh, Kluvers, uh, right? I never said there was nobody there. I said, I said that you exist, but what would it be like if there was no Evert? If there was no Evert there, then you would just pay attention to the instructions and follow them. But Everett's still there. <laughs> so Everett's curious, who is this? What is this? See what's happening? But that's why we can't send the, this guy. We can't take the hindrance and say, ah, I caught you. I'm going to put you in jail. You're the hindrance. Ah, no, no. <laughs> you know, because the hindrance is innocent. He's not temporarily insane or she is not temporarily insane. Actually, we're the ones that are trying to learn the meditation this way with not letting curiosity creep in and push us over there if we get weak. So how's the solution? Now what's the solution? To learn to pay attention to your energy, your investigation, your mindfulness investigation and energy. And this is a, seven, a development, persistent development gradually of your seven enlightenment factors. So your job is remembering that they're not just at the end where just before you fall into cessation, that's where they are. You, your job is to remember all the time from the time I begin my meditation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. There's mindfulness, investigation, energy, joy, joy, right? Then tranquility, and then there is concentration and equanimity. The, that stuff right there, uh, that stuff that is the seven factors, they have to come in balance. And when we start practicing, they look like this. There's seven of them, and it looks like a computer game where we're trying to balance these guys in an old fashioned computer game into going like that so we can go in the next level. That's what it, that's what's like, kind of like asteroids, <laughs> you know, old game of asteroids. You're trying to get enough of them, hit enough of the target. So finally it'll just go there like that. So I'm trying to identify for you, it's, it's, it, it is something in us that is falling down when that comes up, but going beyond how it comes up, it just happens in your brain, all that stuff's in there until it knows for sure you are not going to feed it any nutriment anymore. And that's what he found that's so interesting. They will just fade away if we don't feed them our personal attention. See, that's the thing, yeah? Now I did have a student last week, I had to tell her to go kick a tree. <laughs> she said, yeah, but I hate them, I hate them. I want them to just stop. I said, well, if you hate them that much, you need to go outside, be sure you have a boot on and kick a tree, <laughs> you know? Just kick it and she would go outside. She said she tried it, worked pretty well, got a little angry, <laughs> but then kicked it some more, laughed at the anger, laughed a little more, stopped kicking the tree. <laughs> you know, because, because there's no reason to go beyond what we just explained. Because if this is here or any idea pops in your head, you're the one that's responsible for just letting it go relax, smile, and come back. Or if you move to it, we cannot blame that hindrance. You came to it. It did not oh. put a lasso on your, and pull you over there. You get it? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, clear, thank you. Yeah. Okay, is it clear it up okay? Yeah, it's, uh, like sometimes mind can be re really sticky. It will just stick to anything, but that's the curiosity you talked about. 
Yeah, that curiosity. Somebody said to me, well, why isn't curiosity in there more? I said, it is in there, but it's like one of the things, it, there's two pieces. I'll tell you what my teacher said. He said, there are seven factors of enlightenment or awakening factors, okay? He said, there's mindfulness. Uh, there is this investigation, energy, joy, tranquility, concentration, and um, equanimity, right? But he said also, and it's because of what you're asking, he said, there is a thing that is, is two words. One is curiosity, and the other one is persistence. Why are these two not part of the seven factors? And he said, I think we should make them nine. <laughs> and I said, well, I think, you know, instead of making them nine, I mean, they already took the jhanas and they turned them into eight. That's because they were refused to explain to you that infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception and non-perception was part of the fourth. It is a subcategory of the fourth jhana. The mental ones are, you have to have the stability of the fourth jhana in order for these four to occur in the mental realms, okay? But modern people decided, okay, now we have eight. <laughs> so that changed in the last century or last uh, 50, 60 years. And um, they didn't do anything about the seven factors of enlightenment, but I'm not the only one that's talked about this. I've heard other monks talk about it too. This element that exists with inside you is the same one that exists inside the cat. That cat just cannot, you've met people who you say, well, do you stay here? I'll check the room and don't move. And the kid goes over and he opens the door to the closet and the bad man is in there and comes out and grabs him. You know, the kid is just too curious. You see, so human beings, they have an element of curiosity in it's in our nature to be curious. But so this is something we have to get a control over that to not let our curiosity go. But I'm trying to show you beyond the curiosity factor of, of going over there that you need to be responsible for the elements of your practice itself and stop and check those first if you need to. Did my energy just fall? Is that why I wanna go over there? Is my mindfulness, I'm just not, I'm not interested in my investigation, it fell down. These are yours, part of your practice over here. See, that's where it comes in. If I told you that there was no self, you'd say, well, I'm not here. How am I going to do that? <laughs> no, no, you don't get to do that. You are physically there. That's why I'm telling you that to understand self and no self, you have to say it's not about the subject self and no self. It's about the consequence that's this part the consequence of self and the consequence of my behavior when there's no self and this one over here becomes selfish and personally driven and this one over here becomes selfless and discovers a much freer way of living and kinder and this one gets angrier and tighter and tougher with the selfish of i that's where the i goes to then you, why do we still talk about it, Sister Kim? Because you live in a conventional reality because everybody is walking around with I and you and he and she, you cannot eliminate pronouns. One of the most ignorant things I ever had anybody do was walk up to me once and said, I, I thought that you and your teacher were more developed, but I find when I'm speaking to you, you still have the use of pronouns. I scratched my head all day about that. How was I going to go to the store? How was I going to, you know, drive the car? How was I going to go in and reserve a hotel? How was I going to do anything if I never again said I, you, he, she, they in my language? It was just so stupid. It would have been okay if it had been a joke, but the guy was really serious. That was where I realized something is off here. <laughs> 
something is really off. Because we, although we study the ultimate reality, what are we doing? We're doing it to figure out the ultimate potential of our brain and how we can have more uh, brain usage for innovation, invention, problem solving, peace negotiations, everything, if we let go of the past and we let go of the future and start to work right here now, you see? But if, you know, people want to get tongue-tied, you tongue-tied on this, so I don't even know how to talk about it. It was very funny. I didn't want to laugh in the person's face, but I felt like it. I, I did, you know, I didn't know, I didn't want to embarrass a person, but honestly, how can you ask someone that and say, you, you think Arahats just walked around and and went, it didn't happen that way. It didn't. You can't convince me that happened. So we have to get this down. Why? We have to get this to the place where the illiterate truck driver at down the block by the corner can understand it as easily as the president of some country. This all has got to be able to be explained in a simple way. So is that good? <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Thank you. Okay. You all set? You all ready now? <laughs> Everybody okay? I'm sorry I'm so goofy. I, if you only knew, they gave me so much medicine and told me to eat rice and curry for five days. <laughs> I'm like, I'm thinking this will, this too shall pass away. I, I know it. I'm in a better mood. And they told me, don't drink five gallons, drink three liters. <laughs> so I couldn't win. I was drinking too much and then I was drinking too little. And so that's the story <laughs> okay so we say the blessing okay <laughs> may, may suffering may ones be suffering be free and the fear struck fearless be may the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief may all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I'll see you next time. And be good. Be curious, but don't. Don't be too curious, okay? And, and certainly uh, invent lots of good things to help people, uh, but don't, don't be curiosity in the cat. It can be dangerous, okay? Bye-bye.